Hi, my name is Doug Vo from the Diehl Foundation. It's April 6, 2023, and this is a pretty important video. Um, it's going to answer some questions that I've gotten from uh, engineers and people regarding inertia, but explains why our Earth's rotation stops during the reversal, hence causing the Great Flood. Anyway, uh, what causes the Great Flood? Mentioned all over the world. The uh, second one is the greatest secret of the, uh, the second greatest secret of the universe, and it truly is. Nobody understood why a planet would stop rotation during the time of the reversal. You're all going to find out. The 10 ton elephant in the room is the deep sea canyons. We know they're there. There's only one way they could be formed. I'll explain it later. The core of the Earth is slowing down. This is a uh, most recent journal article that came out. Back to the basic theory of multidimensional reality is the only way you can explain it. What happened with inertia at the time of the reversal? And that's the key. Um, the only reason I'd be able to figure out this stuff is because of philosophy, like I've explained before. Unless you have the right philosophy, it's like the picture on a 10,000 piece puzzle. You pick up a phenomena, which is a piece. You don't know where it fits. You don't know what it's related to the rest of it. That's why I was able to leapfrog just about everybody else in these fields. Again, I want to thank the engineers and some of my fans who sent me emails uh, regarding inertia. And they're right in asking it. I, I don't get mad at people for asking a question. It's, for one thing, there are very intelligent questions why, and they're correct. It took me, what, 16 years since the last book I wrote, you know, God's Day of Judgment book. Um, and I did several videos on it, but really it's, it, it wasn't until about middle of uh, March, about March 14th, that um, I figured it out laying in bed in the morning. And it's the, only, it's the only explanation, and it's going to surprise you. <clears throat> anyway, but I, th I thank them for doing that. Um, anyway, let's continue. This is uh, obviously a picture, <laughs> a painting or a computer graphic of, the, of a great flood. Now, the height of this thing will be you know, three, 400 feet. That's merely the, the continental shelf. No, <laughs> when it gets to the deeper part of the Pacific, like uh, um, you know, 18,000 feet, 15,000 feet deep, that's what's going to come aboard, and these buildings look like little sandcastles. <laughs> and that's, that's the problem. I, I covered this subject, um, not with the, the explanation I'm going to give you now, in video series 4, parts 3, uh, 4F, 4G, and uh, video series 5, goes into the mythologies where I show which mythologies wind up mentioning flood, which is common for the, all over the world. This is the 10-ton uh, elephant in the room, which uh, traditional geophysics cannot explain, oceanographers can't explain. It's just there. And the people who try to say, uh, talking about inertia, should look at this first you realize something's wrong, but you don't know what. Now, fresh water is lighter than salt water. And the only way this could have cut a channel, this is the Norfolk Channel, channel on the East Coast, all the way down to the bottom of, of uh, the Atlantic, which is a, goes down, uh, they were about 13 or 14,000 feet. So the only way they could be is that there was no salt water or ocean water here for a brief moment in time. And you're going to know the mechanism. These are, uh, uh, I covered it in the other videos, but they're all over the place. They're all over the world. I'm going to go through some of them. This is a Cape Hatteras off uh, New England. And you can clearly see they're river channels. Well, the only way that could be happen is a lot of water came off of this thing, and there was no ocean water here at all. This is the continental shelf. goes down to about three or 400 feet. So all of a sudden, it's cutting it all the way down to the bottom of the Atlantic. 
Here's another the Hudson River Canyon all the way down to the bottom. Um, coast of Washington and Oregon, the uh, Columbia River Channel all the way down to the bottom of the Pacific. Same thing, Monterey Bay, all the way down to the bottom, 11 or 12,000 feet. You can clearly see all this is evidence of a lot of water rushing off the continental shelf and cutting canyons in there, lots and lots of them. This is the uh, Gulf of Mexico, same thing. Maybe they call it a canyon. Um, this is off the coast of Chile. This is off the coast of Brazil. This, um, they, these are canyons here. They didn't do such a great job of mapping off the coast of Brazil. I guess their geological society doesn't have the funds to really do as a good a job as we have. Um, again, off the coast of Brazil. And all these are canyons. This is probably the beginning of a delta. <laughs> this is the natural drainage area for, for if the ocean came over the Andes and around these mountain ranges in Brazil, it would drain out in, in this direction, uh, leaving a lot of silt material here. Um, this is Australia, South Australia. How do you like that? Big canyon. Uh, Barrier Reef in Australia, off up there. Um, there it is, same thing here, going all the way down to the bottom. Um, where was this? Um, I think I forgot where it was. It really doesn't matter anymore, does it? Oh, I think it's still Australia, uh, off its, its west coast. And there's the canyon all the way down to the bottom. Uh, this is off of Ireland. You can clearly see the same thing. This is their, their um, uh, continental shelf cut all the way down to the bottom. Here's a, another picture of it, but it's all along here, everything. This is all small canyons off its continental shelf. The only way it could be is at one point there was no Atlantic Ocean there. That would have been, that would have been the last cycle. The, the, last, the way the Earth rotated then, everything went in a easterly and a westerly direction. This time it's going to be an easterly direction. And this is in Spain. Same thing. Uh, <clears throat> this is the article that they were referring to. Quite a few people reported it. And I'm going to, I read it. I actually have the, the journal article. Um, and uh, they reported two Chinese um, geologists, geophysicists, they, they had uh, reported the Earth's inner core may have an inner core, which makes sense, and I'll explain why. Uh, the inner core of the core was estimated to be 808 miles in diameter. <clears throat> That's just an estimate. You'll see there's another estimate. The change in waves behavior is like, uh, likely accurate and meshed with previous research. Uh, this is again from Nature when they they do a science alert and they basically brief, briefly uh, go through the paper and tell you what it is. Now in the new study with Yang and Song, his last name is actually Song, uh, has revisited the old data comparing it to more recent patterns of near identical seismic waves, which suggests the inner core has slowed to a stop. Well, I read the paper. It doesn't really say it went to a stop. It's slowing down and could even reverse. This globally uh, consistent pattern suggests that inner core rotation has recently paused, said Yang and Song. Here's another uh, news article about the same paper. A recent study reveals a new distinct fifth layer to Earth's deep inside core which could help us inform the evolution of the Earth's magnetic field. In a study released this week, a pair of seismologists at the Australian National University documented new evidence of a 400 mile thick solid metallic core uh, ball at the center uh, of the Earth's inner core. Uh, geophysicists, uh, the innermost inner core with a different structure from the outermost inner core. 
Now, that's important. They're beginning to admit that there's something inside the center of the Earth that's not a, a solid iron core. This very existence, uh, uh, innermost, uh, innermost inner core, makes us think about how it could form. They don't have a reason why it, uh, it can form. This is really what the, the Chinese and the other ones are talking about. There's an earthquake here in Alaska. It, the, the P waves go through the center of the Earth. If they can get a sensors over here on the opposite side of the Earth, they would wind up seeing how the waves change. Here's an example. S waves are surface waves, and this is how deep they go. The P waves are the ones that go through the center. This is an old picture. They aren't going to show an inner core in an inner core. But you can see what it goes, and then it drops down, and then continues up. And this is what they're measuring, these P waves. Here's another picture. Solid inner core, imagine a core within this core. These are the eight reasons. The center core cannot be a solid iron core. I do not know and understand how they could still think that or teach it. These are the eight reasons. One, the Curie temperature of 18, uh, 1418 degrees is when iron loses its magnetic properties. In other words, its, its atoms become disassociated not in a crystal form, and they wind up uh, being random. They're kinetically, they're moving around too much, so they, they lose the ability to be a magnet. <clears throat> it would be impossible for the center of a core to be cooler than the surrounding outer core of molten metal uh, at over 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's actually some places higher than that. The pressure of gravity on the core would cause the temperature to increase like how a diesel engine works. Um, you put oil in, uh, oil fumes, and you compress it, to, I think, 16 to 1, and it explodes. It gets hot and explodes, and that's how a diesel engine works. So how they think that you can have a cooler core when the outside is, is so hot, plus you have gravity pressing on it. The DE, F1, and F2 electrostatic layers in the stratosphere up to the thermosphere have to be created by an electromagnetic energy source in the core. But a solid iron core cannot do that unless it has an outside force that's oscillating it. They don't want to go near that. <laughs> There's also an electrostatic field found 50 miles plus over the equator uh, all around the Earth. It also has originated at the center core. An iron core cannot do that. They discovered that when they put up satellites, all of a sudden the satellite crossed within five degrees of the equator at 50 and 100 miles up, it got a lot of static. Well, that static is electrons, and that has to be produced inside the core of the Earth. Same thing with the DEF1 and F2 layers. <clears throat> if the inner core is slowly is slowing down in relationship to the crust of the Earth, then explain how a solid iron core changes it, it, its inertia without an outside force. They, they left that out totally. They didn't think about that. Six. The Earth's magnetic field cannot be created by a geodynamo, dynamo, which is supposed to be powered by an ample supply of earthquakes to keep it operating. One of the scientists that were involved with the early studies, and what was in the 70s, early 70s, was Professor Busi from UCLA. I met him. I lived in UCLA, in West LA, and I spoke to him. And he actually gave me some of his tear sheets from the journals, and I have them at home. And I told him, you know, how can you have um, these, basically they, they draw columns of, of magma going up and down, and supposedly this magma produces an electrostatic field. But when you have multiple columns of magma going up and down, 
their magnetic fields are going to cross each other. When you have two magnetic fields crossing each other, they cancel each other out and you won't have a magnetic field. Also, the way I have it drawn, if it was all originated from the center where the heat source is, then you have multiple poles. We don't. We have a North Pole and a South Pole. That's it. They forgot about it. But he, he didn't change his viewpoint. Uh, okay, the other part was this. The number of earthquakes has increased, uh, but the magnetic field of the Earth has been decreasing for the past 65 years. The number of earthquakes have already been increasing, too. <coughs> that means there is no relationship between the two. It can't be. Seven, the number of earthquakes and erupting volcanoes follow the sunspot cycle, but lag by four to seven months. That can only mean that whatever is in the, the inner core of the Earth is dynamically changing its output, just like our sun. I found that, I discovered that in, what was the 1980s? And uh, I explained in one of my earlier videos in series four, how I discovered it. And there was a direct correlation. It was three or four months if it was at sunspot maximum, it was like seven or eight months when it was sunspot minimum. It just, took, it just takes time for the spike of energy, which is heat, to percolate to the outer core and then the mantle, and then you have the crust floating on this more viscous uh, material, and you can get an earthquake real easy. This is the 10-ton the elephant in the room. The Earth has been growing in size for over a billion years. We know that from seafloor spreading, like the, uh, the uh, Mid-Atlantic Ridge and the several ridges in the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean. Um, I'm going to cover this subject in another future video. And uh, uh, there's a gentleman who does a video that did a great job of showing it a, a time lapse video where all the continents do fit together, except the thing, the, glo uh, the, the planet is growing. Now, geologists kind of knew that, or suspected it, that a billion years ago, the place was smaller. But anyway, this is the zinger. That can only mean that whatever is in the, the inner core of the Earth is producing matter. If it's producing matter, that's not an iron ball. That's something else, which you're about to find out. Here's the uh, D, E, F1 and F2 layers. Now, down here is the electron volts per cubic centimeter that these represent. So the F2 layer represents, uh, it could be as high as 990,000 electrons per square centimeter, per cubic centimeter, rather. That's a lot. These can only exist if there's something in the center of the Earth that's oscillating multiple frequencies. Each one represents a different frequency. That's the only way you can wind up getting a waveform. In fact, I mentioned it in one of my earlier videos on the subject, and I came up with a, a center core of about 50 or 60 miles, if I remember right. Now, there's a formula that every ham radio operator knows, which if you know the wavelength, you can figure out the size of the antenna. So that's how I came up with it. And they're getting closer. They, they're down to 400 miles. And one place I think I saw it was like 200 or 300 miles. But anyway, that's the whole point. Um, by the way, a AM stations count on this to, to bounce off their signal. In fact, when I was gold mining up in the Klondike, this is what, 1967. And um, we heard Wolfman Jack transmitted from Tijuana up in the Yukon Territory, Canada. <laughs> I'm not kidding. And that's called a skip. And that's when they, they bounce radio signals off of these, these layers. I was wondering, I was thinking about where I'm going to place this. It's from Plato. Uh, so I'm going to, I put it here because it's so important that, you know, Plato's like 
380 BCE, they knew something in the past happened. But when you read it, they knew a lot. <clears throat> You'll see it in, in the statement. I gave the reference down here. It's also in, in Loeb's Classics, too. There was a time, well, by the way, this is also in Gazia Judgment, uh, the chapter on ph other philosophies. There was a time when God directed the revolutions of the world, but at the com uh, completion of a certain cycle, he let go. The certain cycle would be that big clock cycle of 12,068 years. And the world, by its necessity of its nature, turned back and went around the other way. In the case of the world, the per perturbation is very slight and uh, amounts only to a reversal of motion. But the truth is that there are two cycles of the world. There are. They go uh, east or west. <coughs> <coughs> Uh, in other words, it let go again and has a reverse action during infinite ages. This new action is spontaneous and is due to the exquisite perfection of balance to the vast size of the universe and to the smallness of the pivot upon which it turns. That's the key word. They knew this reversal happens very quickly. Back to the theory of multidimensional reality. This graph is so important. Um, it's basically the guts of it. This is the model and describes how an atom comes into this dimension, what's going on in the center of a planet and a star. It doesn't really describe what's going on with a quasar. That's different, which I did explain in one of the videos. <coughs> I have either this is Planck's time or he's measuring from a proton to a neutron is Planck's time. <coughs> now, I drew it as a, a modified square wave. The reason is, and I'm going to explain, if you have lots of even sinusoidal waves, when you have a whole bunch connected to a carrier wave, they're grouped together, it starts resembling a square wave. So what happens with a, uh, um, an atom, like for instance, iron has uh, 4,300 spectral line frequencies. Uh, if uh, anything that's heavier than it probably has a lot more, we just don't know, we can't sense them because it's probably in the high ultraviolet and we don't have the instruments by which to detect it. But that's what's really going on. But this is the same model, it's the same program, what's going on in the center of a planet, which is a seventh dimensional existence, or a star, an eighth dimensional existence. It's just vastly more frequencies, millions maybe, hundreds of thousands, I don't know. Nobody knows yet. <clears throat> so as, for instance, the atom comes into this dimension, it traces out and it, it moves around. Now, I think I used 60 of these arms when I was doing this model. This line here represents the, the information graph, the modified square wave, as it goes around in time. This is an example here of one of them. In fact, this is in video series two, is on the Hebrew alphabet, creation of the Hebrew alphabet. It may be one of the most important books I did because 22 views of this waveform, every single one is a result of viewing it as it crosses the x-axis, right there. Every single one of the 22 letters. This is a micrograph that was done at Stony Brook University. The professor actually gave me his photographs. And this has 20 points around it. You could maybe say it was blinking in and out in a cycle this many times when they photographed it. <clears throat> this is a micrograph of a hydrogen atom, 256 
picometers, I think that's billions of a meter, all the action is going on right here. This is it. The electron shell is here. This is what we see as the atom. But really, what's going on is really this. So what is this made up of? It's the electrons. That's what these are. These are the result of the electrons of this thing pulsing in and out of existence. So here's an example of the atom, or it could be a planet or a star. All the action is going on in the center modulation point. It creates the field, and it creates what we call matter. That's when it's crossing the x-axis, this spike here is what we call matter. But it's really electrons contained by information. Maybe that's the best way of putting it. <coughs> this is a micrograph of, of light, of an element. It was done in, uh, in Italy, by, and this is the credit. They deserve credit for what they did. And you see the full spectrum of that element. But notice it has peaks and valleys. How do you like that? Why did they have peaks and valleys? I've got to explain latency, what latency is, to understand what we're dealing with. Uh, latency is the state of existence, but not yet being developed or manifested. In other words, you have information in a computer. Your video card assembles the information and sends it off either 60 or 72 or 120 hertz or that many cycles. So when it's not transmitting, it's not sending an electron to your TV set, what's on the TV set? You'll find out. That's latency. In computer technology, uh, uh, jargon, the delay before a transfer of data begins flowing an inst uh, instruction of its transfer. In other words, you have an electron, you have a bit of information, and the latency is the time it takes to, to go there to someplace else. <clears throat> but always the information still exists, in our case, back in the die hole, in, in this case, in a computer. But it's still there. It's just you don't see it yet. Latency of a pixel on an LED uh, screen. At 60 hertz, that represents 16.7 milliseconds corresponding to one frame. That means that every 16.7 milliseconds, a new image is displayed on the LED screen. Well, when, what happens when it doesn't send the electron to that pixel? You don't see anything. The pixel's not on. Back to our Italian friends who made that, that photograph of a, a light. Here's your pulse. That's where the atom was created. And we got a valley here. We got a valley down here. Here's the times when it's created, valley, and then created. So here's my famous graph. I have to redo this now. You'll understand why in a second. Uh, when it crosses, this is the information dimension. When it crosses this imaginary x-axis, what happens? What happens there? Well, I drew it better. There is no matter. The matter part disappears in the equation. The information still exists for it in the die hold, but this finite point that Plato talks about and I talk about may only last to us six minutes, 15, 20, 30 minutes for the time of the actual reversal. There is no matter. It's just the information. Now, we're fourth dimensional existences. So we have other information that's still being directed towards us, besides the information that makes up our physical body. But at this very point, there's nothing other than the information, but not the physical matter. Now for my engineer friends. We're dealing with 
momentum of inertia. But to do this, you have to figure out rotational inertia first. That's the L in the equation. So L, rotational inertia, is equal to mass times velocity times the radius. When you bring L into here, this is under normal physics, uh, you have inertia then equal to angular momentum, brought from there, to angular velocity, uh, omicron. The problem is, at the time of this reversal right here, m is zero. That was the key. It took me 16 minutes to finally figure it out, and I did it in bed in the morning thinking about it. Zero times velocity times radius gives you zero for, uh, for the iner uh, uh, rotational inertia. That means this equation means nonsense. It's done with. So you don't have inertia because you have no mass. So what does it mean? Um, what it means is that the Earth's rotation will slow down beforehand. Uh, even the Air Force knew that from a RAND Corporation paper I showed in one of those earlier videos. And um, that was back in 1966, they knew it. The, the issue is then, let's say the Earth's rotation slows down to, let's say, 800 miles an hour. It goes at 1,000 miles an hour. That's still too fast. I mean, it really is. Uh, at this time, there's no point, there's no matter. Inertia disappears. When it goes past it, down here, one of those carrier waves that the clock cycle is on evidently changes direction of rotation. And when it does that, all of a sudden, the Earth will start rotating in the opposite direction picking up speed about the same rate of which it slowed down, but still it's going in the other direction. Now, we don't know how long this period of time is. It could be minutes, but if you're one of the survivors and you're in a cave or a pyramid, you could, at the time of the reversal, when you're seeing your hand as a bubbles of light, you could stick your hand in the granite wall or on the pyramid. You'll just feel like pressure around it and pull it out. Don't leave it there unless someone's there with a chisel and a hammer to chisel your arm or your hand out of the rock. But your hand will be OK. <clears throat> this is the phantom leaf and curling photography. Physicists have to wind up saying, well, you must have put the, the, the leaf on top of the, the uh, electrical plate uh, and then photographed it and then took it away later. No, it wasn't. Uh, and I go into that in one of the videos also. This is the matter still there. There, this part of the coleus leaf has been cut off. But you see the bubbles of light. Now, that's important. Here's another leaf. I, I'm not that happy with this picture, but... This is also a phantom leaf here. This is where the cut is. Here's the matter part. The reason why, well, this is the matter here, why you have this glow or this voltage or like uh, electrons here is because remember, phantom leaf is created by high voltage, high frequency. You have an anode and a, a, a cathode, two plates. And you pass the voltage down through it. So. The matter part of the signal is still here, so it's basically the electrons give the information um, uh, a potential that it, you can actually see it. But re realize also this is uh, 90 degrees on a phase from the direction of the electrons. That's why you see it. So, but here, what we call the consciousness part of the leaf, or even if it's an animal or us, you're going to see these balls of light. Now, it led me to believe, or I think, why didn't the Middle East or the Far East come up with the idea of chakras or 
energy levels in the body, glowing energy levels. The only thing I could think of is that basically the survivors saw something wherever they were, caves or whatever, and they saw there was bubbles of light around our head, our heart, and other parts of our organs. And I don't know if they were able to even express it, but they did describe it, and I think this may be a result of what their forefathers saw at the time of the reversal. But I don't think they know really why it happened or where they got this idea from. <clears throat> That's the end of it. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you've learned something. And the, the issue really now is, uh, this is what causes the flood. And it also looks like the earthquake at the time of the reversal is going to be pretty violent. You have to build thinking of earthquakes that are going to last for hours. And ocean waves, this is why I don't want anyone building anything that's within hundreds of miles of the west coast of anything. Because you're going to have that ocean or sea coming at you pretty quick and pretty violent and pretty high. Your best chance is caves that are on the east coast of something and in very stable rock. And uh, even though you could build uh, for sandstone or something like that, but you're going to have to use a lot of steel girders. So because of the earthquake issue. And the door system is very important. Uh, Diehole Foundation is the 501c3 Science Foundation. This is what we're doing. And the next is finding uh, engineering companies to give us a quote uh, for the door system. Then I'll submit um, a, um, a grant proposal to uh, DARPA or to DHS and see what happens. I'll give them the opportunity. If they don't, then we know we're on our own, period. In which case, the next step is we have to wind up sending geologists down to Peru, uh, Brazil, South America, maybe central parts of Central America, Mexico, and, and doing it ourselves because um, they'll let us out, out to dry. I'm going to have a, another video that's going to be on the follow-up of what's happened uh, with Senate Bill 4488, which as far as I know is, has not left the uh, committees yet. Uh, if you can, you want to do something constructive, write to your senator and congressman to get that bill out and voted on. Anyway, thank you very much for watching.